I don't know. All right. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for coming. Um, today we have an important topic. Uh, we're really talking about increasing uh, peer interaction, and certainly appropriate peer interaction among uh, general ed peers uh, and children with disabilities. And I think it is important, especially for this chapter, for you to think back about when you were a student in school and some of the social interactions that you had as students and how you felt being a student at school with uh, other youngsters your own age and the concerns you had about your own acceptance and acceptability with same age peers and so on and so forth. So for our focus uh, question today, I really want to ask you whether or not you can remember being a student in school and particularly being a student of a teacher who appointed team captains and then let those captains choose the members of each of their teams. Were, can any of you remember being in, in a classroom where parents, uh, where teachers did that? Well, I did too. I mean, when I was in school, that's all we did on recess was play dodgeball and base and softball and two or three other things. And so every day at recess, we had about a 45-minute period where we played one game or another, and those games always involved teams. And and on some sort of a rotating basis, the teacher picked a captain for each team. And once the captains were were selected they began to choose uh, from among the, the, their classmates who they wanted to be on their team. And sometimes the people they chose were the popular kids, and sometimes the people they chose were their friends, and sometimes the people they chose were the people who were good athletes. But they were responsible, and as their team was chosen, they got came and lined up behind their respective captains. And that little group out there of students who were left began to shrink to 10, to 9, to 8, to 7, to 6, and so on and so forth until there were just two or three children left. And I can remember being a child in school and having that situation. And I didn't care if my team won or my team lost. I didn't care if Captain A chose me or Captain B chose me. I just wanted to be picked before they got down to those last two or three kids or that last child in particular where the teacher said, okay, you go with so-and-so. And I remember how painful this was for me to watch this process and how relieved I was when I was chosen and how much empathy I felt as a child for those kids who were always chosen last. And I can remember vividly in my class, the kids that were chosen last were always the ones that were chosen last. And, uh, <clears throat> and what an inhumane system that was for, for isolating children in two groups. So one of the things that I want you to start thinking about as we talk about our lesson today are the subtle ways in which you as a teacher can make children feel included and a valuable member of a group and a part of a group and feel like they fit in. And then also the subtle things, the rules and regulations and policies and procedures that we have in place in schools that make children feel isolated and alone and unpopular and, and unattended to and disliked. Because invariably when we elicit these feelings from children in school, what we get back is a set of social behaviors that are very unpleasant for us to deal with. Because when we elicit those feelings in kids, first of all, they don't like us. Second of all, they don't like anybody else. And most of all, they don't like themselves. So I want us to think about the techniques that we have available that can make children feel more a part of the group and more useful uh, as opposed to the things that we do 
that make kids feel isolated. So the subject of chapter two, of chapter eight today is promoting inclusion with classroom peers. And we know that classroom peers can be really an instrumental part in helping to accept students with special needs from the very first day they enter a general ed classroom. And there are some things that we can do as teachers to ensure that they are accepting and inclusive rather than rejecting of children with disabilities when they come to our general ed classrooms. And preparation is one of the things that is most important in this arena. You need to really let your students know beforehand what to expect. You need to describe the new student, describe the types of uh, behaviors that student is likely to exhibit, the types of uh, disabilities that may, be, uh, may govern that child's uh, skill acquisition or behavioral performance in some way, and see if you cannot elicit ideas from the students in your class about the type, type things they can do to make this child, first of all, feel more accepted, and second of all, the things that they can expect. For example, we were talking last time about autistic children and the fact that autistic children may not be very efficient at sharing. By the time normal children are in the second or third grade, sharing is a routine part of their world. They know exactly how to share. They've, they have learned that sharing is important and sharing is seldom a problem that a second grade teacher has to work on a whole lot. But if you get an autistic child who's six or seven years old in your second grade general ed classroom, this may not be a skill that the autistic child has mastered. So it is important for the general ed students to know an autistic child is coming to our classroom. He has some specific skills that he is working on and one of the things that he is working on is sharing. Let's think about what might happen if we are on the playground or we're involved in a certain activity and, the, and, and you have an experience with this child not sharing. What are some of the things you think we could do that would help this student learn to share? Because what we need to do is elicit, first of all, appropriate responses from second graders who are likely to take on the role of policemen in this situation, which may not be appropriate. We need to tell them if this happens, you need to respond in these kinds of ways. And can you think of ways that you may be able to help him or her learn to share. So by brainstorming these ideas, you're not only preparing the kids for what they may expect, which I think is very important, but also you are co-opting them and giving them a feeling of ownership over this problem. Uh, one of the reasons that having children participate in rule setting and determining what the consequences are and determining what the rewards are going to be, one reason these techniques are so effective is that the kids feel like it's their program rather than an administrative or bureaucratic lay-on that is made by the teacher. So we want them to feel ownership of this program and feel like it's their program and their decision and their job to help this child learn a new set of techniques and also to respond to any misbehavior or, or below level skills in ways that make them better rather than make them worse. I noticed a long time ago, many, many years ago, I was in a school that had a culture fair. And some of you may know, when kids are about six or seven years old, they're very particular about what they eat. I don't know exactly what the dynamic of that is, but for some reason they have a very narrow menu and only eat a few things. Anyway, I went to this school that was having a culture fair and and of course one room the culture they were studying was uh, Japanese and in one room it was Indian in one room it was uh, Mexican in one room it was African and so on and so forth so all of the the schools uh, classrooms in this school had adopted a culture and they were studying that culture and exhibiting that type dress and one of the things that they did was plan menus and prepare food that that were characteristic of the culture that they were studying. And so these little children who wouldn't eat anything but hamburgers and french fries and 
grilled cheese sandwiches were suddenly making foods that were not only foreign to them, but included ingredients they had probably never heard of in their natural lives, you know. And oh, they were so excited to go through the line and they were eating all this stuff. You just couldn't believe it. I kept looking at these kids saying, I can't believe they're eating this. And of course, then it dawned on me why. And that's because they had helped in the participation uh, and, and participated in the in the um, uh, in the creation of these foods in these menus, and so they they began to accept this as something that was going to be good to eat. And of course, usually when we think food's going to be good, it turns out to be that way. So I began to practice this at home with my own children, having them help with the cutting and chopping and doing different things that young children are fully able to do. And I was amazed at the range of food they began to eat that they hadn't eaten before because they felt a sense of ownership and involvement in this food. And I think this same kind of principle is very important when we are including children with disabilities in our general education classrooms. It's important for us to let them participate in problem solutions and deciding how to respond and what to do and how we can be helpful and inclusive. So keep that in mind. One of the <clears throat> techniques that your book recommends for increasing the empathy and sensitivity of general ed children is to have them participate in an activity called the circle of friends and in this activity the kids are each asked to draw four circles on a piece of paper and then they write in those circles members of the classroom and community and family and so forth that fit various descriptions first of all people that you just barely know but you see under some circumstances and then the next level of intimacy and so on and so forth up to very close friends and family members and so on and so forth and and of course in a general ed classroom with youngsters who have been in the same community for many, many, many years, usually they'll have lots of names in each of the circles because they'll they'll have um, intimate relationships as well as as acquaintances in many of these extended areas. And after you go through this activity with students, you can then ask the students to think about what it would be like if they didn't have anybody's name written in circles one and two. And of course, that's frequently the position that a new student will be in when he or she comes into your classroom, whether or not the student has a disability. All students who come from far away don't have many contacts in the school with which they have an intimate connection. So anything along this line that helps increase uh, students' awareness and increases their empathy levels for, for students who are new in their classroom is an important <clears throat> uh, function you can serve as a classroom teacher. Now, your book talks about several models of peer interaction, uh, and, and each of these uh, serves uh, a different purpose, but uh, the first model that uh, the book talks about is uh, a peer assistance program. And uh, when, when we're talking about peer assistance, we are really talking about programs that are structured to help students um, with a, a disability or a special need, for example, the need might be um, a second language. You might be, if you're a seventh or eighth grade teacher, you might be in a classroom where a student comes from another country, uh, immigrates uh, in the in the middle school years and is in the classroom and, and speaks no English. And so it's very important for that student to have a peer assistant or someone to serve as a translator for him or her on an, on an as-needed basis. But the 
point of a peer assistance program is to have someone who has been identified that can help a student with an individual need at any point in time when that need expresses itself. Uh, a special type of peer assistance program that is described in your book is called the Special Friends Program. And in this particular example, upper elementary age students uh, can be trained to interact with uh, students with usually severe disabilities and they come several times a week, maybe three or four times a week for 15 or 20 minutes a session. And in the particular study that was quoted in your book, the treatment lasted over an eight week period of time. And of course they noted many, many positive effects for the students with uh, disabilities. First of all, uh, they thrived on the attention. Second of all, they um, entered into a situation where they had appropriate models, social models to learn behavior from, and so on and so forth. And there were the expected results for the students with disabilities, but some unexpected uh, results also occurred, and that is there were many benefits to the peer assistance in the regular ed program. And, and one of the main benefits, of course, is they became very aware of the diverse needs of other people and sensitive to those needs. But I have known several situations, and when we get to our guided practice, I'm sure Kim will share an experience she's had in this area. But there have been programs where this was done all the way up through high school students. And uh, uh, I had a student at one time who's, who worked in a high school and identified uh, this type of special friends program. We often refer to these type programs as reverse inclusion programs because we're really bringing mainstream behavior and mainstream youngsters into the special ed classroom often because these children are not ready yet for uh, participation in a more inclusive setting. But in any event, the high school program that I'm familiar with was implemented and the first semester, of course, the teacher had a great deal of difficulty finding uh, general ed youngsters in, at the high school level who were willing to volunteer to participate with the uh, severe and profoundly handicapped youngsters. But after the program had been in operation for a year, she couldn't find enough children with disabilities. She had so many volunteers, she was slotting them in, you know, around the clock. She was saying, oh, you, you can have two or three, you know, because this became very, very popular. And I think we have a need to give back. People have a need to give back. They have a need to help others because we all know uh, the reciprocal part of that, the part that says when we need help and how valuable it is to have resources uh, available to us for meeting our own needs. So this notion of reverse inclusion or special friends program is an important one and it may be something that you can work on if you're a general ed teacher or vice versa if you end up being a special education teacher you can set up uh, a special friends program or some sort of a reverse inclusion model if there are youngsters in your school for whom inclusion is not yet a realistic possibility. In, in whatever peer assistance program uh, you mention, it's really a situation in which uh, students are paired for the purpose, uh, really the sole purpose of having one student available to assist another student when necessary. And uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be arduous or time consuming for the child who serves as the assistant. Many of the things that they are asked to do uh, really uh, are uh, pro forma for a, a youngster who is able-bodied but may be essential uh, help uh, for the student who has a disability. As I mentioned earlier, this type program is especially important for increasing the awareness of the peer assistant and letting letting youngsters know and become comfortable with the diverse needs of, of children with disabilities. And these are skills and, and um, 
really a, a personal referent that will be carried with that child throughout life because he'll become uh, comfortable and, and uh, willing to do that sort of thing. Now in your uh, book, there are, uh, it delineates several disability areas. The type tasks or situations that peer assistance may be helpful with and what kinds of strategies that the peer assistant will use. I'm not going to go over uh, all of these because they're right there in your book for you to refer to as needed, but certainly uh, children with any disability might benefit from having a peer assistant who helped with uh, emergencies, for example, um, fire drills, that sort of thing. Most schools now prepare children uh, for lockdowns, you know, in case a stranger comes in the building and you need to uh, secure your classroom and make certain that kids are out of the view of, of windows and things like that, that somebody can get out with a gun, that sort of thing. Scary, frightening as it sounds, it certainly is a time of a sign of our time. So you might need uh, to appoint a peer assistant in this case, in case a lockdown occurs for a child who is severely impaired or who doesn't see well or who may not be able to hear the alert. So these types of things are are very useful and your book outlines many, many of them for children with a whole variety of uh, disabilities. Um, so you might want to take some time and look at that. Now then, when you're thinking about establishing a peer assistance program, one of the things that you need to keep in mind is children have to learn to do this just like they learn their other lessons. I think one of the, the mistakes we make as teachers is assuming that children will know how to work with a peer assistant or assuming that peer assistants will know how to help somebody or we assume that kids will know how to tutor. If you know how to add, you will know how to, to tutor and help someone else in that activity or they'll know how to work in cooperative groups. And of course, that isn't necessarily the case. So sometimes it is uh, incumbent upon the teacher to train the peer assistant or peer tutor for the role that he or she will be assuming and also be very circumspect in the students that you choose to serve as assistants or tutors or whatever. Not all children are uh, necessarily well suited to serve as peer assistants. Certainly a child who serves as an assistant has to be at school all the time. If you have a child who's frequently absent, has a high rate of absenteeism, they are not a very good candidate for being a peer assistant. Also, you need to have a peer assistant that consistently exhibits appropriate social skills. We certainly want the assistant to be a good role model for social skills and a good role model for academic skills. The student has to follow instructions reliably and has to be willing to conform to the expectations of this role. Certainly the student has to have a reasonable attention span. If the peer assistant can't stay on task, he will probably have difficulty keeping uh, the child who's being assisted on task. I think sometimes as teachers it's our inclination to say, oh my goodness, you know we have to choose the brightest student or the highest achiever to be the assistant. And that isn't necessarily true. Sometimes high achievers are good peer assistants, but sometimes they're not very good candidates. They may not be as patient and as understanding of somebody who has difficulty as a child who who is less academically capable but has a personality that's more suited to this role. So certainly the selection of your peer assistant is a, an important variable as well as making sure that they're well instructed on the procedures and what your expectations are and how they can proceed and how they can help. Your book also talks about social initiation. 
The social initiation really refers to procedures that are intended to enlist peer assistance in promoting social interactions with withdrawn or isolated uh, children. We talked earlier in the semester about uh, establishing a sociogram with the students in your classroom to determine who the children are who are not popular and who are not uh, sought after for friendships with their same age peers. And when we have identified children who for one reason or another, uh, we've identified children who are not formulating friendships on their own, then we can use the peer initiation uh, process to help them uh, become uh, recognized and identified by peers and this is done by such things as asking the isolated student to play with others by uh, giving that student a shared toy and inviting them to participate with somebody else by uh, assisting the student in using a particular material things that we can do another thing that I sometimes do particularly with younger children because the teachers attitude is so in instrumental in shaping peer perceptions is I will identify uh, areas to compliment a child who I think is socially withdrawn or a social isolate and I will make it a point three times a day to say something to that child a positive comment about how well they're working or you've done such a good job would you like to be the helper and and then comment on what a, a wonderful job the child has done I had a young girl once who she was six years old and she she was in a psychiatric hospital she had a very unusual condition it was called conversion hysteria but anyway uh, what that means is she uh, had elected not to walk you know she she would not she had convinced herself that she couldn't walk which was why she was in a psychiatric hospital and she was a beautiful little girl and had been in the first grade and, and over Christmas she had caught, gotten the flu and was sick in bed. She just never refused to ever get up again. It really was an effort, I think, to avoid school. She had been put under a lot of pressure by her parents to achieve probably at a level that was beyond her ability. But in any event, by the time we got her, she was in this situation and she was totally withdrawn. She interacted with virtually no one. And we finally did get her to walk again, which was problematic enough. But then when we did, she didn't interact. She would just go out on the playground, you know, and not do anything. So I started having her do things in front of the group, like pick up papers and distribute papers so that she had to interact with other people. And they had to start getting to know her. And I would let her turn the pages when we read books and things like that. So she was beginning to be familiar and, and to others and also comfortable in interacting with them uh, in a situation that was very neutral, like passing out papers and picking up papers where there isn't any right or wrong, there isn't any chit chat that has to be involved. It's strictly a uh, focus type conversation. Are you finished? Will you give me your paper? That sort of thing. And it was very effective. Eventually, over a short period of weeks, she began to play with others on the playground and so on and so forth. But sometimes if you sit and wait for this to happen on its own, it doesn't happen. You know, the child just sits alone and does nothing. And these are not things that take any time. They are things that are initiated by a change in the way you think about children and the way you interact with them and the way you talk and the things you say when you're going about the regular business of orchestrating your classroom. One of the things that I know above anything else is teachers don't have enough time. Nobody has enough time. I don't know if you've heard it on TV or every time I turn on the TV there's some other report on how sleep deprived Americans are. I know you all think it's because you're a college student but let me tell you the bad news it doesn't get any better apparently. There, We're in a nation of sleep deprived people who are eating to make up for it. I'm not, I'm not sleep deprived, but I'm eating to make up for it anyway. So anyhow, 
things are not going to get, the bad news is things are not going to get any better once you're a teacher. You're still going to be sleep deprived. So I try to think of lots of things that you can do that make a real difference to the kids in your classroom, but don't take any additional time. That doesn't take any time. The social initiation doesn't take any additional time in, on your part. It just requires a shift in the way you think about children and a shift in the kinds of things you have to say to them. And oftentimes you can use these children in ways that actually save you time and accomplish your social end as well. So something else for you to think about. Now your book talks about peer tutoring. And certainly if there's any educational intervention that has been studied and studied and studied to death, it's peer tutoring. Uh, and there are just a, a, a multitude of studies that suggest that peer tutoring does in fact uh, increase uh, academic performance. And, uh, and, has, and has with it a whole bunch of other very positive side effects. And uh, certainly peer assistance is sort of a, um, a branch of peer tutoring, but peer tutoring in and of itself carries a clear-cut expectation for increased academic learning. The reason that we assign peer tutors is that we think a child has not either mastered or practiced sufficiently the academic skills that he needs to learn in class. And so he's given additional guided practice activities by an identified peer in his classroom who has specific objectives in mind for him to accomplish. and. Um, you know, most peers are not really capable of initial instruction of a skill or acquisition of a new skill or task. But most of them have already mastered the tasks that the child needs to be working on because that child has been a member of the class already. So the peer tutor already knows the answer to these questions. So he is particularly well suited for, for practice activities and after the initial instruction is over, if a child in the class hasn't achieved a appropriate fluency level or level of correct responses, then a peer tutor can work with him and increase his level of proficiency on the task that was presented in class. And your book sets up a, a series of steps for establishing a peer tutoring program uh, that begins with, first of all, of course, identifying the content of the tutoring session, exactly what is it that we want the peer tutor to teach, what is our plan, you know, what is the plan that the student needs to follow, how is he going to execute this uh, activity. Uh, he needs to be clear on what his role is as the tutor and what the child's role is who is going to be tutored. Uh, the teacher certainly needs to make a careful monitoring of performance to make sure that that both children in this dyad are responding appropriately and exhibiting appropriate roles. And then, you know, as a follow-up, you can collaborate with other subject area teachers to see if maybe this program could benefit them as well. Now, we know that several benefits are likely to accrue to the child who is being tutored. They are certainly likely to increase uh, their academic achievement, which is the goal of peer tutoring. But in addition to that, uh, there are some other good things are likely to come from this experience too. One of those is that uh, studies have clearly documented the fact that when students are, are peer tutored in a subject, they really develop more positive feelings about the academic academic area in which the tutoring takes place. Um, we also know that peer tutoring is the most, you know, uh, beneficial when there isn't an individual teacher assistant who can work with the child and when the child is not sufficiently mature to exhibit the independent study skills of mastering these materials on his own. There are also some uh, benefits to children who are being tutored and I think this is extremely important for you all to concentrate on because 
when you are a parent of a child and your child comes home and says, oh, I'm tutoring somebody all day, every day, well, your first inclination might be, say, how come you're not doing your own work? You know, you don't, why are you doing someone else's work? Uh, so the parent is likely to be concerned if his or her child is a tutor for fear that that child, the child who's doing the tutoring will get behind and not learn as much as he should. So one of the unexpected benefits is that peer tutors for some unknown reason usually benefit academically in the areas in which they tutor. And I've never uh, uh, figured out any reasonable explanation for this. I mean, your common sense tells you if a child is, ha has mastered something well enough to teach it to somebody else, that they ought to be learning the next step level up on the continuum rather than going down here to work with somebody else. Why do we get these results? I'm not sure. I don't know exactly what to attribute this finding to, but the truth is what we find out is that children who tutor actually gain more in the area in which they're tutored than other children who don't serve as tutors. And I really don't know the explanation for this. I think probably uh, there are several reasons. Maybe focusing on an area and having to teach it to somebody else really gives you greater clarity about that. I mean, I think that's a possible explanation. I also think that uh, we probably uh, don't challenge uh, academically advanced students as much as we should and they can probably learn what more than average exponentially more as time go, goes by in the time that they have remaining so that they do not really suffer by the time that they spend tutoring. I don't know but I do know that it's reassuring for you to be able to say to parents with certainty it's fine for your student to be a peer tutor because studies have shown that kids who do the tutoring actually advance more in that academic area than those who don't tutor. Often the tutors uh, benefit in attitude uh, toward their tutoring partner. They may become fond of the student that they work with and establish social connections with this child. And often the tutors have a better attitude in general toward school. Though, we, you need to recognize as a teacher that tutoring doesn't necessarily guarantee improved socialization. That stu and students may certainly be, uh, need to be trained on how to act uh, uh, appropriately during tutoring sessions. And if you consistently find that a student doesn't respond appropriately during uh, peer tutoring sessions, you need to eliminate that student or retrain him because <clears throat> if the peer tutoring experience doesn't have the desired social outcomes, the academic outcomes aren't worth it. You know, if the kids argue with one another or if they're disruptive or they're argumentative, it doesn't matter if they make academic gains, it isn't worth it. So it's important for you to monitor carefully the socialization process and make sure that that's on track and going like it's supposed to go because if it isn't that sort of thing needs to be eliminated. Now um, when you have peer tutoring there are a variety of models that we can talk about. Now one of the uh, models uh, is similar to what we were talking about in uh, with the peer assistance program when you got older children from a general ed classroom to come into a classroom with children who were severe and profoundly handicapped. In that case it's, it's a cross-age assistance program and certainly with cross-age tutoring we have older students come in and serve as tutors for younger uh, and lower functioning students. And of course, there is a tremendous reward in there 
for the child who is being tutored. And you'll find if you implement this type program in your school that in a short period of time, you'll be overwhelmed with uh, volunteers to serve as tutors. There isn't any shortage of kids who, who are willing to serve as volunteers in a cross-age tutoring or cross-age peer assistance program. But the emphasis with the program of this nature is to take older, more capable children and introduce them into classrooms with younger children. This is sometimes even done when campuses are close together. For example, I was uh, one of my Quest II clusters was on a campus in Galena Park one time several years ago. And this uh, particular elementary campus was annexed with a middle school that was on the same camp, you know, on the same block. And so in this very w easily within walking distance and without even having to cross a busy street, children from the middle school could interact with children from the elementary school. So in the cases like this, you have a natural uh, built-in opportunity for cross-age tutoring, though it works very well for children in the fourth and fifth grade to go down to children in the first and second grade and so on and so forth. There's a big difference in age, even between the first children in the first month of the first grade and the last month. One of the, how many of you want to teach uh, kindergarten and first grade children? A couple of you, well, one of the things that you're going to notice when you start teaching is that your first year, it won't seem so strange to you. You know, the kids will come to school and they'll just be the kids. But they change so much and they mature so much over the course of a year when they're five or six years old. They have developed exponentially beyond the level they were at which they entered school in the first place. And so the next year in September, when you go back and see your children in your classroom, you'll say, who are these kids? They're such babies, they can't do anything. And you'll have the sense that your class is so much lower functioning than it was last year. And why these kids can't do anything? And last year, my kids could do this and that. But of course, by the end of the year, you will have seen that same developmental phase occur. So all of this is to say that children change so much in those primary grades, just from one year, the beginning of one year to the end of one year, that the difference between a a fourth grade child and a first grade child is just huge in terms of, of cross-age tutoring and uh, certainly it is, uh, it must be built in, I don't know where else it could come from, it must be genetic, but younger children just adore older children. And it's amazing, I noticed when my children were babies, that even when big kids were as large as adults, even when they're babies, they know that, that big kids are not adults. They know that they're children and they relate to them differently and light up when they come in the room. And this is true of children who are one or two years old. They are very clear on the fact that a 14 year old may be as big as an adult but is still a kid, you know, and they relate to them that way. So there is an incredibly motivating factor with this older child, younger child relationship. Um, same age tutoring, of course, pairs children in the same grade level or even in the same classroom with one another. In this case, of course, the children who are more academically adept are assigned to tutor youngsters who are less skilled or youngsters who haven't mastered a set of objectives in a particular area. But certainly in this case, as well as in the cro case of cross-age tutoring, you're capitalizing on this natural developmental level that kids have by the time they're in, in school as they begin to shift their emphasis from wanting teacher attention and teacher approval to wanting to work with kids and others their, age, their own age. I think uh, this <clears throat> developmental level speaks also 
to why cooperative learning strategies are so motivating for children and why they're so productive for uh, motivating children to stay on task and stay connected and stay hooked up because they know if they don't, then we will revert back to another model where they're in rows and columns and they won't have a chance to interact with one another and work together and do these kinds of things. Um, your book talks about a model of peer tutoring called class-wide peer tutoring. And uh, <clears throat> certainly class-wide peer tutoring is one of the most highly uh, recommended strategies for achieving academic achievement among a diverse group of learners. In this case, everyone in the class is divided into learning teams. They are often at learning pairs, and certainly you should start with pairs because this is, once again, a skill that has to be learned by the students. But you can divide all your students into pairs and then have them alternate roles of tutor and, and uh, the child who's being tutored and use this strategy for helping them master academic skills. It's wonderful for things like learning their spelling words or learning the multiplication tables or learning the states and their capitals or these things that we just have to learn and memorize and go over and over and over and over. Lots of times these things, tasks that are so routine and dull will become more motivating and more meaningful for kids if they are allowed to work in pairs with their friends or with somebody that they like or choose to work with. Um, you have to be very careful about this though because of course everybody has to be held accountable for staying on task and the teacher has to be very careful about monitoring. Uh, your book gives some guidelines for implementing uh, class-wide peer tutoring. Uh, first of all, uh, this can be done in a way that uh, all students are not reading from the same book. I mean, one st uh, student in the pair can have one set of spelling words, the other student in the pair can have another set of spelling words or vice versa or vocabulary words they're working on or levels of, of math computation or whatever. As long as the materials are there to help the students check the right and wrong answers, each can be working on independent educational objectives and still have a useful program. Um, I encourage teachers a lot to work on academic games because I think games are such a good way to teach the content in things like social studies units and and math facts and reading vocabulary words and phonics skills and these kinds of things and and uh, each student can have this his own or her own stack of things he's working on like reading vocabulary words or phonics skills or math computation one can be doing 10 digit addition with regrouping and another can be doing single digit addition but you have what you're working on right there and then those become your cards that you have to answer and then the board game can be whatever you want it to be baseball or soccer or monopoly or anything you want it to be where they roll the dice and go around the track but in order to move their tokens they have to answer a word a problem or a series of problems uh, correctly and uh, as a beginning teacher you need to start accumulating these kinds of materials that are fun and motivating for children so that you can just reach in and have them on hand and use those for extra uh, independent practice or guided practice even if you want to be sure and monitor that everybody uh, does know what they're supposed to know. But the, the kids love to do these things. I think they're playing when in fact they're really working very hard on the objectives that you have specified for their learning. They're just doing so in a context with their peers so they think it's fun. And I personally think school ought to be fun. I think as teachers we ought to question why school isn't fun. I think it ought to be fun for teachers and I think it ought to be fun for kids. And if school is not fun, we need to be asking why. You know, we don't have to suffer through life anymore. The age of Puritanism is over. We can have a good time and engage in purposeful activities and purposeful learning 
that are not necessarily measurable. But beating kids on the knuckles with rulers, you know. Teachers are very quick to talk about how horrible the homes are of all of these children. Oh, well, their homes are so horrible. Their parents do this, their parents do that. You should see the way they live, et cetera, et cetera. No wonder, no wonder. Look at their homes. But then the kids don't come to school. So what does that tell you about their perception of school? They must think school's worse, right? So I say, have a, show them a good time. Keep them on task, but have a good time. And letting them interact with their peers is one very motivating way to do that. And you can do that and still hold them accountable for learning at the same time. And you can do it by making children with disabilities feel included as part of a community of, of, of their same age learners because they can be working on the things that are appropriate for them that are propelling their learning <coughs> forward without necessarily doing the same thing as a student who may be functioning at a higher level. So in any event, uh, you can use a class-wide tutoring and you can do so while individualizing the curriculum but if you're going to use this system, you probably should implement the system for at least three days a week, for 30 or 35 minutes a week, and do it over an extended period of time so you will have the op an opportunity to assess the value and the success of the program to determine whether or not it is achieving its end of uh, teaching more information in a shorter period of time. Um, in implementing peer tutoring, teachers should certainly uh, make sure to train students to become helpful tutoring partners. They, as I mentioned earlier, they don't necessarily have this skill on their own. They may even need to be taught specific words and gestures to use in reinforcing their partners to appreciate effort and that sort of thing. Uh, tutors need to emphasize good sportsmanship and cooperative social behavior and certainly they need to praise their partners and reward correct responses. This is not a system in which the tutor administers punishment. I mean we don't want uh, a school is punishing enough without getting in groups with your same age peers and being tutored but it's important to get uh, uh, appropriate feedback and be praised and uh, encouraged for effort and and uh, and praised for uh, cooperative social behavior and this sort of thing. I think that uh, implementing a system of class-wide peer tutoring is particularly important if you are in a classroom where the tox test is going to be administered. Much uh, of the content of the tox test is basic skills oriented. It's drill and skill type stuff. The kids have to learn it. Uh, one of the reasons that I, I'm not fond of the tox test is it doesn't make any accommodations for individual differences. About the only way you can escape the tox test is being placed in special education and even that won't uh, exempt you uh, always which is probably good but in any event I'm, I, one of my main objections about the tox test is that it doesn't make accommodations for individual differences I mean everybody in the third grade is supposed to know the same thing on the same day at the same time and you're not rewarded for any knowing any more than that uh, but you're punished miserably if you don't know at least this much of it. So first of all, the content of the tox test is set. The learning objectives are specified. As a classroom teacher, you have no um, license for, for interpreting or negotiating what the students are expected to do. And most of it is drill and skill type stuff. So how do you do that in a way 
that makes it fun. One of the things that I hear repeatedly is that my Quest 2 students say, oh my goodness, we're in the third and fourth grade this time, all they're doing is talks. You know, they, that's all they do, especially in the fourth grade, all they do is talks. And the kids are so bored and the teacher's so bored. Well, I think that's true. I mean, the nature of the information we're requiring kids to learn for these minimum competency tests is, is very dry, really. It's not very interesting. So what do you do as a teacher other than worksheets to make that fun and exciting and motivate kids to want to do it? The only way really that I see most kids motivated for the tox test is fear of failure. And that isn't a very good way to motivate children. We'll talk about motivation and affect. I'm not sure if it's next week, but if it's not, it's in the very near future we talk about motivation and affect. Though it's impossible to disaggregate motivation from all of the other things that we talk about. It's such an important area and so instrumental in governing what we do and how we do it and the extent to which we effort over it and so on and so forth. But what if you have this given called the talks and you have these objectives that are non-negotiable and so you set it up in a way that the kids are doing games to master these objectives. What if they're in teams and you have a bulletin board on your wall and everybody, if you're in a place where it's basketball, this is the final four, so it could be basketball this week, it could be a basketball tournament, or if you're in that school district where basketball is king, it could be a basketball tournament. If you're in a, where race cars are king, it could be a racetrack. But in any event, you have your kids and you're moving them forward on all their toss objectives and then when they get to your bulletin board shows who's measured what toss objectives all the way. And then when you get to a certain point, so everybody's mastered this one, you can celebrate. And when everybody's mastered that one, you can celebrate. But the basic teaching, learning, and practice for the tox test is set up in some sort of learning teams or learning dyads or cooperative groups in which the kids are helping one another ma master the tox objectives and they're monitoring one another and celebrating each other's successes and celebrating the uh, achievement of the group when everybody ma masters so many we get to participate in this way and that way and the other way. My feeling is if you could make tox the tox test more fun, you would get a higher level of achievement on it than you can by torturing kids and motivating them with fear of failure. If you could motivate them with parties and celebrations and interactions with their same age peers and games and things that are fun for them, things they come to school and want to do every day to see who's going to get the reward and how quick they can get a pizza party and how quick they can do this and that and the other. I'd much rather have a pizza party than worry about failing myself. I don't know about you, but it makes sense to me. So as a teacher, we need to look at the things we can change. It's kind of like the sobriety prayer, you know. You have to change the things you can and uh, work or get around the things you can. And since the tox test is something you're not going to be able to change as a teacher, about the best you can do is make it fun and motivating for your kids. And lots of the suggestions in uh, chapter 8 I think are good for that, are good for motivating kids to work on the tox test and also motivating them to become a community of learners rather than celebrating individually when they master an objective. They can celebrate as a group when everybody or their team members master the objectives. And you can have competitions to see which members of your group get there the quickest and so on and so forth. These kinds of things I think are just crucial for us to pursue if we're going to be uh, stuck with a lot of these, this basic skill training because it isn't really very conducive to constructivism and discovery learning and some of the 
uh, other instructional strategies that we know uh, captivate children's attention <coughs> and motivate them in, in a more proactive way to want to learn. So anyway, you can think about that as you move closer to teaching. Your book uh, devotes a great deal of chapter eight to cooperative learning. And I really think that cooperative learning is probably the single most uh, <clears throat> important strategy for you to master as a teacher if you're going to work with students in grades four through eight. It is uh, so essential that you capitalize on this developmental level that governs child behavior in such a way that it says the most important thing for me is to be around my peers and to have their approval. I don't know why kids approach this developmental stage in uh, adolescence and pre-adolescence. I can't tell you for sure, but I do believe uh, with all my heart that it is indigenous to the human species, and so it must have something to do with survival. And I suppose that if youngsters actually continued to want adult approval and be motivated and seek adult approval for all of their lives, they would never become the adult because they would be too contingent upon the approval and control of their parents. But I can tell you, if you have children or haven't yet, or if your children haven't reached adolescence, what you're going to find when they get there is that um, you, you hold sway in a very different way than you did when they were five or six years old. And the most important motivating factor for adolescence is peer approval. And they go through extensive social um, machinations to isolate themselves from adults. And you can notice this by their clothing and their hair and a whole variety of other things that separates them from their parents. And, and I suppose this is because they have to reject their parents and learn to be adults themselves. And then, of course, eventually they usually come around to being more conservative than their parents were. But for that period of time that they're in rebellion, it's pretty miserable and uh, probably necessary for survival. Surely God wouldn't have inflicted that on parents for no good reason, I, I can't imagine. But in any event, um, we have the potential as teachers to capitalize on that uh, developmental level. And, uh, and cooperative learning is a model that allows us to do so. It is important, however, if you are going to acquire the skills necessary for being an effective uh, cooperative learning teacher that you you see and you're, you sense a change in your role. This is hard for most of us as teachers because we, are, we have been taught uh, from the time we entered school at approximately the age of five or six years old that our job as a student is to come to school and sit down and listen to the teacher and learn what the teacher says and give it back. We are taught all along that that is crucial for us. And suddenly, when you enter the realm of cooperative learning, you're entering a realm in which your role as a teacher make some dramatic changes. You're no longer really the dispenser of information, but you're more of a facilitator of learning. So you don't necessarily stand up and go through the entire lesson cycle and uh, assess the students and move on to the next thing. You may um, introduce the lesson, specify the objectives, even give a presentation or some examples, but ultimately the students start working on their own learning and your role shifts more into one where you monitor the groups, you make sure that they're on task, you're available to answer any questions they have, you ascertain that everyone is in assuming an appropriate role, 
And then after you, your groups report back or complete their activity or exercise for the day, you may uh, provide a lesson closure and restate the objectives or whatever, but you're much more a facilitator of this learning process than you are the dispenser of information that says this is what you need to know, one, two, three, four, five, let me show you how to work these problems. Now let's take a test. It isn't that sort of a learning model anymore. So it is very important for you to shift in your thinking to this new, you know, model that you're going to be facing. Now, the other thing is that students uh, may need to be taught this as a learning activity. What my theory is that many teachers give up on cooperative learning before they ever teach their students how to work in cooperative groups. There's a learning curve for the students just like there is a learning curve for the teachers. Kids don't automatically know what they're supposed to do when they get in these groups and they try out different behaviors. Sometimes you may have a group where you have to say, oops, we can't work in groups anymore. No, you're not following the rules. We, in order for us to work in groups, students have to follow rules, they have to assume appropriate roles and so on and so forth. So you may have a false start or two where they learn the consequences of not exhibiting appropriate social behavior when they work in groups is to go back to a more traditional teaching role. There isn't anything wrong with that. But be prepared for the fact that, there, that a child who has been in school for two or three years in a very traditional setting with a teacher who lectures mostly and does worksheets is not going to automatically know how to form a group and be a productive participating member of a group. They experiment with the degrees of freedom in these groups like they do in other social settings that they're learning. So when you start to use cooperative groups, plan to teach them how to do it and plan for them to experiment it and test the limits a little bit where you have to bring them back. One of the techniques your book mentions and also the companion website shows you some examples of a T-chart and the purpose of a T-chart is to really delineate what the class is supposed to look like when, the, when cooperative learning groups are working on the you know, there are two columns, T columns, that, ex that, that, that describe what the room is supposed to look like in those adjectives and what the room is supposed to sound like in those adjectives. So kids are getting a thorough understanding of exactly what they are supposed to do when they move into cooperative learning groups. Now, if you will look on the Web CTV Vista when you go home, I believe that I have included for you a whole variety of, cre of cooperative learning uh, uh, alternatives. Your book talks about some very sophisticated learning teams, dyads and scaffolded type things and, and, and that is wonderful once you become proficient at cooperative learning. But that is too complex a place for you to start teaching children how to work with one another. It's too, it's too complex. You need to start with very simple interactions with clear and clearly defined and focused objectives. For example, if you wanted to start uh, with cooperative learning in your classroom and you suspected that your children were not proficient in learning according to this model, you might work with them on uh, their spelling words and you might divide your group into 12 pairs. In other words, you would have one student paired with another 12 of those times two would be about the 24 students that would be in your room. Then you would put six of those groups on team, tick six of those pairs in team one and six of those pairs in team two. And then you would have them work on their, the pairs, work with each other on their 20 spelling words, practicing them until each 
member of the pair would reverse roles until they both knew how to spell all 20 of those words, right? And you could give them some learning strategies. Like you could give them five learning strategies. If your partner has trouble learning, have the partner write the word five times or say the word out loud or you can have a resource center where they use sandpaper letters or make the letters out of modeling clay but they're working together to learn how to spell these 20 words for the spelling test and you may have them work together for 10 minutes each day till the test on Friday and then we'll see of these six groups on team one and these six pairs in team two, who has the highest average? And that, that group will have a party for the other group or whatever, do you see? This is a very simple way. Two kids working together. There's not four or five or seven, just two working together. Their objective is very clear to learn the spelling words. This is something they understand. It isn't writing a report or looking up something on the internet or something they've never done before. It's something that's very clear. You could do it with, with uh, math facts or reading vocabulary words or anything else you wanted to do. Spelling just came to my mind. I think spelling's a good place to start. I, I like spelling if you're starting something new because the spelling words each week are new. It doesn't matter if you made a zero on the spelling test last week. This week is, an, is a brand new start with 20 brand new words. With reading, it isn't that way. If you didn't learn the words last week, you can't read the sentences that include the new words from this week. So spelling is sometimes an easy place to start. But that is a good way for you to start getting your students involved in cooperative learning. Then when they learn that, you can move to more sophisticated models that involve three or four children and and models in which one child is a reporter and one child is a researcher and one child is a scribe and one child has some other function and they're working together each doing a different continent to have to learn about the economic or geographic regions of the seven continents or whatever it is. Does that make sense to you? Don't start with that sophisticated approach though let the kids learn the basics when all they're learning are the rules for being a peer tutor, what the classroom's supposed to look like, what it's supposed to sound like, how this is supposed to happen, what the outcomes are, and that it can be fun and easy. Then you can add varying levels of sophistication as you move into it. So, back to the Web CTV stuff. I've posted on the WebCT Vista different models of cooperative learning. There's oh many of them, I don't know, 10 or 20 of them. And they're just suggestions for how you might have children start interacting with one another with the general outcome purpose of learning in mind. In other words, the two essential components in all of these models is the kids are working together in one way or another and they have an instructional objective in mind. There's something, there, an educational outcome they're supposed to accomplish as the result of the fact that they have worked together. So those are just the essential elements and once you've tried some of these simpler forms of cooperative learning then particularly if you're a teacher of fourth, fifth, sixth grade students or older, you can start experimenting with four and five uh, group member cooperative learning teams and things that are interdependent and interrelated with one another and much more sophisticated. But the basics of how to do cooperative learning, you ought to start in a very simplified way. And I put this on the Web CT for you because I thought it was something you might want to, to print off and have with you uh, as you move through your studies and enter into Quest 2 and start becoming responsible for planning lessons and groups and things like that. We're actually today for our uh, guided and independent practice, we're going to do a cooperative learning lesson, really uh, sort of a peer assistance thing. But uh, So we're going to do this, but you'll be called on to do this throughout your teacher education program. And so I thought this would be a good model. It's
something that I've used for years and years to help uh, emerging teachers get started with this notion of using peers to help each other learn uh, and capitalize on the developmental levels where these youngsters are and the motivating properties that we have to offer by having kids work with one another. Now before we uh, go more completely into cooperative learning, I'm going to stop for the break, let you all have a break, come back and finish up with this chapter and then we'll do our guided practice. <music>